So you you see you see uh, um, that lineage from Ben Jones to me to yes. Stephanie. I yes. Yes. That's, that's that's what art is supposed to yes. do. Art is supposed yes. to, to grow yes. the community, right. and you can grow the community with art. Ben Jones passed down his information to me. I passed it down to Steph. Steph passed it down to other people. Man. So, you know, that's what art is. It's, it's this organic exchange of information and energy. And when it when it does that, then it's combustible. It explodes and reaches all kinds of people that you have no clue that it's going to reach. You know, I, I know. I Steph. I knew. You know, I taught kids dance and photography and art, but Steph is one I knew. I said, she's going to be a photographer. I knew that about Steph. And when I did the interview with her, I didn't know she did photography. Oh, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. And um, then some month, months later, I saw a picture of her with her, I think, Nikon, and I started laughing. I said to her, I was like, what you doing with that in your hand? And, uh, and then she started doing the pictures. And I saw some I saw some nice shots. And when I saw that, when I, because you know, like, when you see, people photograph you can tell like where they are you can you can see their eye and I saw one shot that was really tight I was like oh I was like that and when you see that you're like okay just keep um, keep honing that skill keep, keep working on it yeah she got her own company um, Rose and Concrete I think it's called got a website right right right, right. Steph is, Steph she had a little show but she had a show at uh, Maccabees College, and she had one two little show at Essex County College yeah. And, and Ben Jones was talking about, um, when I asked him a question, I said, Ben, so what makes you excited about um, what you see in, 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 in a, an artist, the work or what? He said, it's the young people. He said, sometimes the young people, and I never heard it put this way, he said, sometimes the young people um, bring certain energies, different energies that you never saw before or you never would think that you would do something a certain way. But when they do it that way, it makes you believe that something can be done differently or looked at in a, in a different way. Yeah. Um, so, and that's why I love the series. Welcome to um, the Artist Recreates the World. I'm with Manta. Hey, Musa. Thank you. And um, a tremendous artist in his own right. Um, just um, say that statement you told me before about we all are artists, I love that. Because a lot of people don't think they're artists, you know, but um, doing this series, I've learned that people have several hats. And it's as you embrace the hats, don't be dictated by culture, but as you embrace those hats, you find your place. So can you add to that? Yeah, I believe all people are artists. Some people don't realize what medium they like the most, or one that they can operate in and operate in and have fun and make creative art. But I believe everybody's an artist. Every day of your life you're living your art as an art form. You may just get up and make a fabulous meal that looks good. You just made some <laughs> art. You know. Right, 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 right. Um, we create every day, but it's it's no it's it's knowing the intention and knowing the intention and then following up on that intention. And again I say always when we see so much TV and film and commercials that frame our narrative, then we go out and do that thing. Instead of letting our mind, our culture, our, um, our spiritual understanding of what um, universe is, what the world is, what God is, filter through us and then um, let that be the art. I mean, I, I just looked at some of your stuff. Um, just tremendous stuff and it's not stuff that we see ordinarily I mean that's something that's been filtered through you yeah um, and filtered through me basically through this town the city of Newark which is a tremendous art town I mean if you were a little kid and you could go down to Market Street and go to Market in Washington like I did when I was 14, 15, 16 and go to Artists and Drafting Supplies and walk around in there and see all the materials they had you know, being in that store and meeting John Sutton, who was one of my mentors, that was a game changer for a young artist. Just being able to have an art store in Newark of that quality and that size, it broadened your horizons because it gave you a whole idea about the options that you had to make art. So, I mean, this town, like I said, this building, this edifice, the Newark Museum, uh, 
exhibited my work here for the first time when I was 17. Wow. I'm standing there. My art is on the wall. A woman is holding her child's hand and she's talking about my work. And I was like, whoa, that's stuff that I put in it, but I didn't put that in it. So this is what art is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be a game changer. And like I said, in this town, for me, having started out as a little kid from Newark drawing on a brown paper bag with a pencil to exhibiting here and to working here for 26 years and to thousands, literally thousands of people here, you know, at this edifice. This is what Newark is. It's just, it's just this huge combustible art town that gives you all kinds of opportunities to make art. Now, um, why do you think that, that Newark um, allows the art to be so good? I mean, like, I mean, art is good everywhere, but in terms of when I look at the art, when I see the art, I think it's because of the very, like the nucleus, what happened in 67, and that we release, I say we, I'm not original Newark resident. I've been here for about 10 years, but it seems like the, the people from Newark release something within themselves because they've been um, um, suppressed. Um, and, and I see those energies coming out, and that's why I say, when, when I see work from Newark, art from Newark, that it's that that separates us from the, West, the, the rest of the country and the rest of the world. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I, I think Newark is a cauldron. <laughs> you know, it's a cauldron Newark. with this fire underneath it. And, and the insurrection in, in 67 was part of that fire that created all that energy that was in that, in that cauldron. And then also think its proximity to New York. You can actually go in to see world-class art oh, constantly. Oh, good point. You can see it constantly. I think it's our birthright. Um, people from North, we're I-95 people, okay? Our people come from South Carolina, like right. mine I did. That. Like great. Ben Jones' parents came from South Carolina, from Georgia, Virginia. We got this country thing. People, people say to me, what's Newark? I say, to me, Newark is a big country town. You know, we just some, we just some country people, and we bring that that country influence from I-95 here. I was at a show last night, and a kid from South Carolina was using palm fronds in his work. Well, that's some I-95 stuff. That's some country stuff. You know, so that's you know some of the some of the reasons that I feel Newark is this you know cauldron of artistic energy. You know, we're, we're close to energy that we can go to in Manhattan and New York and get there in an hour, you know. We have uh, great arts institutions here, from dance to music to the Newark Museum, that we can also get all this information from. Now, how does the artist become better, in your opinion? How do, whether it's Generation X, Generation Y, the baby boomers, because in this environment, people are realizing that they need to do art, whatever that art is. But how do we assure that we become, we improve upon where we are? Well, if you're an artist, you have to constantly reimagine, redefine, love it. redevelop love it. Love yourself. It. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, you know, like I said, constantly. I started with a, a brown paper bag. And, you know, my teacher, Nettie Thomas, at Week Great High School, taught me how to paint. I left school. I started, I was making collages. Uh, I always loved uh photography so I went down the street here when I was working at the Newark Public Library and I bought a used camera so I could take pictures for my collages and I could take pictures of people so I could draw them without them sitting there moving because at the time when I was a kid that's one of the ways I made money drawing portraits of people wow. so I found this thing the camera well I'm in this neighborhood and I go to Jersey City State College and I meet this teacher Ben Jones who says Listen, would you like to go to a dance class? I said, a dance class? I said, what kind of dance class? African dance class. Oh, I'm, I'm redefining myself. Right. You know, I became a dancer and danced on the stage for 28 years. Awesome. Well, what's the next thing? You know, right now, the next thing for me is here. The next thing is iPathology. I teach children with autism, and one of the teachers at the school, 188X in the Bronx, said, you know, you should try an iPad teaching children. I said, okay. He said, we have some. I'll let you use some. He never did, but I decided to get an iPad because I had come up with a way of teaching children. I said, yeah, this might work. Well, I bought an iPad, started to use it to teach children. 
then found out I could create a new art form called iPodology. While I'm taking the iPad, I'm shooting images, everything from people to landscape to architecture, and then I'm editing it and I'm creating a new art form. So what makes us better? We gotta remember we have to constantly reinvent ourselves. Some of it is a natural progression, but some of it really has to do with, listen, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna find something else to do. You know, iPodology, I found something else to do. I found out I can make flyers with the iPad. I make movies with the iPad. Hmm. You know, and this is how artists have to reinvent themselves with new means of making art. You know, you, you can, I can still, and every day, I still take a pencil, I use a pencil, I use a marker, and I draw on a piece of paper every day. Stay in touch. Every day I do wow, it. Because wow. that's still the best thing I know how to do. But I still say, hey, what's the next thing that you can master? What's the next thing you can learn? And you have to do it not only organically, as it just comes to you, you got to look for it. Right. You got to look for it. You know, you got to do research, you got to study, and you may not master it, that's, you know, not the issue, but you got to find something to redefine yourself so they say, hey, yo, you know, Monsa is doing something new now, it's called hypodology, well, what's that? Yeah, well, love go, it, go I love class, it, love it. Teach a workshop, go check it out. Yeah, Ben Jones was saying, Ben said, um, you can't always wait for inspiration, you have to just be doing the work, you have to be active. Um, I talked to Abisa um, Washington the other day. I did an interview with her, and she was telling me, um, "Well, I'm going to ask you, where does your where do your ideas come?" Abisa said, "Her ideas come from her dead ancestors." She blew me away when she said that. But where do your ideas? Um, I know earlier I talked about spirituality, but where do your ideas come from? Well, same places, same places. My ancestors, my parents. Um, more ideas come from my students. I love to teach because I love to learn and they just give me so many ideas I can't even, you know, I can't even use them all. I'm giving them a little something and they take it someplace else. Um, I get inspiration from my daughter. She's my favorite person on the planet, the smartest, the funniest. Um, so I get a lot of inspiration from her just dealing with her. Um, but, you know, like Bisa, I get my inspiration from the ancestors. They're always guiding me and telling me, yo, do this, do that. Sometimes I say, well, I wish I could talk to my mother and my father. I said, listen, the information that you needed to get from your mother and father, they gave it to you. It's right there. You just have to know how to access it. And I said, you know how to access it. You know how to access that information from your parents. Just access it. So, yes, the ancestors are an important part of my work. I mean, some people live in this country and they don't, grasp, understand, connect to the fact that, listen, you know, there's a reason why you're in this country. There's a reason why your ancestors didn't jump off the boat. There's a reason why your ancestors didn't die in, in the middle past. That's profound. That's you know, profound. There's a reason why your ancestors were able to get off that slave block and say, I don't know what's going to happen, but you know what? I'm going to continue on. You know, uh, People of African descent in this country, we're here for a reason. You know, We're here to make vital change in every it. intersection of American history. Just like the economy is going down. And well, who comes in the office but President Barack Obama, you know, to turn things around? Well, you know, we, we have a purpose in this country. When the, when the Germans are knocking the Allies out in the First World War, who do they call? The 369th Infantry Regiment from Harlem. And they stay on the front lines fighting the Germans longer than anybody else. You see it's over and over again when the Luftwaffe is knocking the, the, the American allied forces out of the sky when they're doing daylight bombing in Germany. Who do they get? They get the Red Wings to protect them, and they okay? Do an awesome and they, and they do an awesome job. And we see this over and over and over again. This is the purpose of our people in this country to make change, to be agents for change. And we gotta understand, hey, the ancestors are telling us that, that's why we were the ones who, who, who survived, so we could give you this information so you could make change. Little change, big change. But you've got to understand this is our purpose, not only in this country, but in the world. Right, I agree. Um, just speak about the, the, that idea you said, uh, you heard Danny Glover say about us. Art is, also can also be social change. Well, Danny Glover said art is the greatest form of community organizing. Okay, thank you. And, you know, I, I do that every day. I see that in action. Um, uh, I don't know how many years, maybe 1979, Ben Jones and I 
I've organized a dance class right down the street here at Black Organization Students at 101 Washington Street. And that dance class stayed in existence for five years. People would come in for four hours, get two hours of dance, two hours of exercise for two dollars. Wow. For two dollars. Wow. And I saw how art could organize the community. We had people come in who were vendors. We didn't ask them for a cut. We knew this was creating the atmosphere of this organization. We had so many good dancers in that room who came on Sunday, we created the Suleiman Dance Company, which was Newark's African dance company at the time. So this is how I, I see art being a catalyst for organizing the community. Um, at the time, I was writing and taking pictures for a newspaper called Graphica. People could come in and pick up Graphica free and get some information from the community. Perfect. So that's how I see, you know, artists being a method of organizing the community. And I've seen it over and over again and done it over and over again. On your website, you have um, the, the saying, I am an eyewitness. Could you speak to that when you talk about you are an eyewitness? You are a citizen of the world. Yes, yes. Uh, and I say in the tradition of Baldwin, Baldwin yes. City is an eyewitness. And I'm an eyewitness too um, of, of, of the different talents I have and have used in my life, you know, to make a life for myself, to be able to work and to travel and do what I want to do. Um, the single gift that the Creator said, I'm going to give you this, oh. is the Creator gave me this <laughs> gift to take the, yes. take the black box, the metal right, right, object, right, right. and to look through it and to wait for the decisive moment and press yes, the button. Yes, I love that. That's and great. then to create these singular images and then to take those singular images and cut them up and glue them together and then make a collage and make something else happen. So that's how I'm an eyewitness. You know, I've been taking pictures in Newark, you know, you know, since 1974, you know, and seen all kinds of stuff in this town. So that's particularly what I mean with a camera specifically yes. and particularly I'm an eyewitness. And I don't just take the pictures, you know, I know a lot of photographers, they take the pictures and you don't see it. The pictures that I take, you see those pictures. They appear somewhere. So it's not like I didn't, I didn't take them, you know, or, you know, working here at the, at the museum, I started working at the museum. A friend of mine, Mark Moore, so I, he was a Ben Jones student. We studied with Ben at Jersey City State College. Mark was teaching a, a, a hat making class here. And he invited me to come. I took some pictures. Uh, Betsy Robel, who was the manager of the arts workshop, said, can you send me some of those pictures? And I said, sure. Sent her some pictures. She was shocked that I sent her the pictures. She said, most photographers say that and they don't send no pictures. Well, Mark Morris passed. He was supposed to teach another hat making class the following year. And Betsy Robel asked me, could I do it? Because she saw me with bags. I said, I don't teach hat making, but I can teach bag making. I can teach people how to do this. So she hired me in 1990, and that led to a whole series of jobs, you know. Nice, you nice. Know, it was all because I took that boom and said, hey, I'm an eyewitness, here's what happened. And she said, oh yeah, these are good. That's how you can use ca the camera, you know, specifically to be an eyewitness. And every, all artists do it. Right. All, you're doing it now. Yes. You know, you're doing it now. You're being an eyewitness to things seen and unseen. I love this narrative in the in the artistry creates the world because I was determined that with uh, gentrification and the whole idea and seeing what is actually happening and know knowing what mass media does and local media does that they reshape the narrative and with these interviews we shape our own narrative because the narrative is here in September um, 9th 2016. Nobody can change this narrative. Nobody can change the history. It's here, live, living, ongoing. And I'm so glad that you came in to be a part of it. So, because, you know, I have Bisa, I have Ben, I have Jerry Gann, and there's so many other artists I want to pull in so they can speak. Because this, the technology is just like you talked about the iPad. The technology is what we can use as part of the art to speak, right, that's true. to be a citizen of the world. Because this allows me to be a citizen of the world, to yeah. report yeah. to Romania, to um, Africa, to Australia, what the artists do here in Newark, and what, more importantly, what the artists have been doing here in Newark. 
Yeah, because yeah. I'm still learning that, and that's why when Ben told me, he's like, "Oh no, you don't have Mansa." He said, "You don't have Bisa," you know, and he just rid off names, and I'm like looking at him like, "Let's do it." So I do appreciate uh, you coming out. Any other things that you you have on your heart or you want to say? Well, um, about the art, about Newark, about the art, and about Newark, and you know. Newark is changing, and that's okay. Um, people say that people coming outside of Newark and doing stuff that people who've been here can't do, and they're correcting that. Um, but people don't realize that these people, these people who are coming from outside of Newark, they're, they're the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren of people who left Newark in the, in the 60s. I mean, that's, that's what you're saying. When I, I, I grew up in Newark, I grew up in Newark, uh, my family moved to Newark and Patterson in 1960. So on Dewey, we were the only African American family on that block in 1960. 1967, 68, we was among many <laughs> African American people on that block. So one thing I like to say is that the people who we say are coming from out of town and gentrifying Newark, they, their parents and grandparents were here before. But let's be clear about why they came and why the artists from out of town are here. They're not, out, they're not coming because there's nothing happening here. They're here because they looked around and they said, Dad, them brothers and sisters is laying it down and laying it down heavy. You know, they weren't going to some place where nothing was happening. They came to some place where something was clearly happening number one, and number two, where they knew there were opportunities to get this piece of real estate and that piece of real estate and that piece of real estate where they could develop something. Yes. But they didn't come to no vacuum. They came to something where, where life was teeming, where art was growing, where there was a whole generation of artists, you know, who were here making art. Gladys Grau, I met Gladys Grau when I was 16 when she had the art studio gallery. I could walk down Lines Avenue and make a left on the Bergen Street and go to the art studio gallery and see these black women working, of which my teacher Nettie Thomas was one. Hey, I know who was here and who was working. Now, I'm not upset with who's coming, right. but don't tell me you came because there was nothing here. Right. You came because you saw something so powerful here that you couldn't resist it. <laughs> you said, yo man, that is, that is the place. So that's what I got to say. Um, that's part of my narrative that, you know, I'm not, you know, somebody who who came recently. I'm somebody Johnny who, come later. You know, yeah, I'm not a Johnny come later. Right, 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 I've right. been here and I done saw it all. You know, and I'm clear about what this town represents to artists, what it represents to African American artists, and what it means to the people in the community here. What art has done for the people in the community. I was here, um, uh, this summer and they had the first outdoor film for the Black Film Festival. I mean that was history in the making but it was so cool that people were out here in Newark looking at a film at night outside in the museum garden and we got free popcorn and water. And you can't beat that. No, that's right. You know, and, and that's a history of Newark where hey, you know they used to have a Newark drive-in 40 years ago. Yeah. So as I was saying, the narrative about art in this town is that there are people who built the foundation yes. of art. Say that. That's undeniable. If you've been here, you know it. Undeniable. But that's not to say that new people can't come in Beautiful. and do work. But the people who are here, you're not going to tell us that it's a new art scene that we just started. You know, it's an old art scene that you're building on. Thank that's, you. That's sir. the narrative. Thank you. That's it. That's it. Thank you, man. Keep doing your thing. All right, I'm going to do that.